Hello friends. If you were not able to be with us on Sunday, then I hope you're well. I hope to see you soon. And this will help you keep tracking with us as we look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I know anyone who doesn't want to live a life of joy, deep joy. Do you know anyone who you think would tell you, like they'd say way down deep, I would rather that my life was completely void of joy? I, I don't know anyone like that. Every single human who I know wants to live a life of joy. And that's a lot of people who want joy. But on the other hand, we could ask the question, how many people, how many people do you know, how many people do I know, who right now are actually living a life of joy? And when I compare those two numbers, who wants to live with joy, who is living with joy, those are different numbers. It's like everyone wants to live a life of joy but not nearly as many people are actually living a life of deep joy. Joy is elusive. It's, it's slippery. It's hard to hold on to. It can be difficult to even define joy. Take a moment and think about a time or a time or two when you would say that you experienced deep joy. So we're going to just pause briefly and think about a time when you experience joy. All right. Now, why would you call that experience joy? Why wouldn't you call it happiness? What? What is different? What makes that an experience of joy for you? And another question is, uh, when you lived that experience, did you recognize in the moment, this is joy? Or would you say, no, that was something that I, I kind of saw in hindsight. Uh, I looked back and I that was a really a joyful experience. The truth is, Joy can feel a lot like happiness, but they are not the same thing. They really aren't. In his book, Surprised by Joy, C.S. Lewis writes about his first experience of joy. His, his younger brother had used the lid of a biscuit tin to create this tiny miniature forest garnished with moss and twigs and flowers and it was Lewis's first time to experience a feeling of imagination. Uh, he looked at this little miniature forest and it created this sense of longing for him. But he wasn't longing for the biscuit tin. It wasn't like, oh, I want to have that biscuit tin. He, he was longing for a different world, uh, longing for beauty. It was joy. And so Lewis goes on. To write about his pursuit of joy throughout his life. He tried to recreate that feeling of joy. He tried to chase that feeling, but what he found was that every time he tried to pursue joy for the sake of finding joy, every time he tried to do that, joy evaded him. It was like he, he was a dog chasing his tail. Joy was slippery and elusive and uncapturable. Now, have you ever done that? Uh, or have you ever known someone who's done that? They, they try to chase joy. They, they try to recreate moments. They try to go back to a time in their life that they would say that was a really joyful time. And so they try to recreate that in some way. I, I've done it. And I'm, I'm guessing you have too. We try to recreate we try to get back a, a, a special time, a special experience, a special season in life and recreate that joy. It, it doesn't always work. 
This wasn't the only thing that C.S. Lewis realized or discovered about joy, that it's elusive and slippery. Uh, he also noticed that when he was not chasing, pursuing joy, he was surprised by joy. It, it just kind of snuck up on him out of nowhere. There it was. And so it led him to eventually conclude that joy cannot be pursued for its own sake because joy points beyond itself. Uh, he said joy is a byproduct that happens when people are open to that which is beyond themselves. When their life is directed towards others, then they're drawn out of themselves and they experience joy. The late renowned psychologist Scott Peck said, simply seek happiness and you are not likely to find it. Seek to create and love without regard to your happiness and you will likely be happy much of the time. Seeking joy in and of itself will not bring it to you. Do the work of creating community and you will obtain it. Although never exactly according to your schedule, joy is uncapturable, yet utterly predictable, a side effect of genuine community. So now that we know how slippery joy is, let's jump in. Uh, today we're going to look at joy and seriousness. We're going to look at joy and depression, joy and freedom, and joy and escape. So, first of all, joy and seriousness. A lot of this is based on the work of uh, Edwin Friedman and Steve Cuss. Are you someone who takes all of life real seriously? Uh, now, obviously being responsible, that's important. But seriousness goes beyond responsibility because seriousness is an orientation to life. Uh, it's You can't laugh at yourself. You just can't because you're rigid and inflexible and the world is black and white, either or, all or nothing. And so whatever the situation is, you have a very narrow way of approaching that situation and solving that problem. And so you're going to concentrate all of your focus in one specific area. And underneath all of that, what's really going on is you have a whole lot of anxiety going on. It's, I have to control the outcome in this situation. And so seriousness causes people to treat everything as if it were bigger than it actually is. And when people get really serious, they lose perspective. The number of possibilities that they can imagine actually shrinks. Now, here we are. We're living in our second year of COVID, and who knows how much longer this is going to go on with, with things the way they are right now. I mean, talk about seriousness for all of us. No matter what your medical opinions are or your political opinions, this situation is affecting all of us in so many ways. And so it feels very serious. Now, when everyone is serious all of the time, it's kind of like there's this explosive gas that is just filling up the room with anxiety. And then something small happens. Someone does something small. Uh, it, it might be a comment. Uh, it's, it's a small event. It's just a little thing but it's like a spark in the room. And normally a small spark in a room doesn't do a whole lot, but you fill a room up with explosive gas and boom, the whole situation blows up. Are you witnessing that anywhere in your life, in your world right now? It's like everyone just, everyone became really, really serious 
and then something small happened and poof, the whole situation just blew up. It's really hard to experience joy if your orientation to all of life is seriousness. Now, even if you say, yeah, but this is, these are serious times. Uh, this situation is so serious. We're, we're living through a pandemic. Whatever we may say there, Jesus lived in serious times. Jesus came to do serious work, but Jesus was playful. I mean, blessing children and pulling coins out of the mouths of fish to pay taxes and sleeping through storms and riding in the dirt and making 180 gallons of wine for a party that was already in full swing, uh, talking in a living room instead of worrying about making lunch, causing the soldiers who are coming to arrest him to fall down before they arrest him, showing up on the Emmaus Road incognito until he's recognized by his disciples, then vanishing. Like, that's playful stuff. When we are too serious, it's like we, we uh, are myopic. We zoom in on our situation and we get so focused, we can't see God. God isn't in our frame anymore. When we're playful, it's like we zoom back out. And so our perspective is larger. And as, as we're taking in this larger perspective, we're also asking this question, where, where is God in this situation? And then we start to see God somewhere in the absurdity of this thing. It's like, oh, oh, oh. And finding God in the picture keeps us from treating everything like it's bigger than it actually is. It, it's playfulness. So a question for you, we just answered this out loud with one another. A quick discussion question. What are some of the warning signs for you or people in general that you, it means they're taking life too seriously. They're taking themselves too seriously. So go ahead and think about that. Discuss that real quickly. On the other side of that question, what is it that might help you to maintain a more playful orientation to life? Is it making sure you have some unscheduled creative kind of playtime? dancing or music or art or coloring or trying something new that you've never tried, getting out in nature, simply appreciating something absurd, something unique. These can be the kinds of things that take that room that was filled with gas and it's like you you opened a window, you, you aired it out, you drained the seriousness out of the room. God is playful and God uses absurdity. And so when you allow yourself to be playful, uh, absurd, you might just be creating some of that space for the fruit of the Spirit, joy, to grow in you. Next one, joy and depression. Now, for some people, COVID has been a season of depression. Uh, it's been a season of isolation, futility, apathy, it's more than, well, I just had a down day or I'm kind of experiencing the blues. Depression is debilitating. It can be like this bottomless black hole that affects all of you, your biology, your neurology, your thoughts, your feelings, your behaviors, your relationships, your sense of self, everything. Uh, it's been said depression is disconnection from self and from others, and from God, from your body. Uh, in depression, you are not you. Uh, so to say there are simplistic, cookie-cutter answers to depression is really to misunderstand what depression is. The worst kind of thing you can say to someone who's depressed is, come on, don't be depressed, feel better. Like, it's not that bad. Cheer up. Sometimes well-meaning Christians 
add a spiritual layer here where they, they throw in a little Bible verse about joy. They say something like, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Chin up. You're not supposed to be down in the dumps. You're supposed to be a joyful Christian. Well, guess how that kind of stuff sounds to someone in depression. They feel like you just told them that they are the problem. That's how they feel. And now they just feel worse about themselves for not being able to feel better. And now they carry even a larger sense of shame. It's like you just told them that they are supposed to be able to produce their own joy. And they're, they're like, I can't produce my own joy. And so now they feel even more disconnected from themselves and from others and from God. One of the differences between joy and happiness is that joy is possible in the midst of suffering because we don't create joy. We receive joy. It it grows within us. We say, okay, I've, I've known some people experiencing joy in hard times. You know, maybe someone you knew who went through a cancer journey or a persecuted Christian and they were still joyful, but, but how's someone in the midst of major depression supposed to experience this, this fruit of the spirit joy? Well, you remember what fruit is simply the, natural product of a life it, it's not you should be joyful it's not well you ought to be joyful because joy isn't about effort joy is simply there it's growing it's god in me and me in god one of the defining characteristics of god is joy uh, the early church when the early church wrote about the character of god they were certain to talk about god as eternally rejoicing, always rejoicing. This life, God has this life that's full of joy and specifically rejoicing over humanity, rejoicing over God's creation, God's children, not their doing, but their being. Uh, I, I like to go back to the, the name. God says, I am who I am to Moses in Exodus. Uh, and it's like, in joy, God is celebrating not just I am who I am, but God is celebrating you are. You're you. So to, to God, that's something worth celebrating. Just I'm celebrating that you are you. Now, in depression, what does this look like? Well, it means realizing that God's not judging you for being depressed. God is not judging you for your unmade bed and your ratty hair and the sink full of dirty dishes and how horrible you feel. God identifies with your pain and your suffering and your depression, and God feels that. But that's not the only thing going on because God rejoices over who you are. It's, God's not looking at what you're doing. God is looking at who you are. And God thinks you are incredible. God celebrates you because you are you. You know, Jesus compared joy to the way that a mother looks at the face of her newborn infant. The mother is not smitten by what the child has done. Because if you're asking, what has this child done? <laughs> this newborn infant... Uh, just nearly cost the mother her life, uh, blood, paid. Uh, it, she's not smitten by what the child has done. She's smitten by who this little child is. There's never a moment that God isn't looking at you with that kind of joy. You're you. So the path to joy in the midst of depression is the path of accepting that. You're you. I am me. And yeah, this experience feels like agony, but it doesn't change the fact that God is rejoicing over who you are. God isn't judging you. God isn't rushing you. God is rejoicing over who you are. And so God's not only above you, like you're in the bottom of this deep black hole and 
uh, miles away at the top, God's reaching down. No, God's below you and around you and holding you. And it's like that little infant with its mother. God is around you like that. And you can rest your little head down on your mama God's chest and sleep and rest because God is rejoicing over who you are. God's joy seeps in and surrounds you. You're you. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Joy and freedom. We all grew up in a society that told us that freedom is about the pursuit of happiness. That, that's the Declaration of Independence. Your life could be good if you just had this. <laughs> in 2019, uh, the last year that we have some good stats, advertisers in the United States spent $240 billion to tell us your life could be good if. It's the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness creates this insatiable appetite for bigger, better, new. It's consumerism. Now, why is it that this world is full of people whose homes are crammed full of stuff? They just have to have all those things. And so they have closets and garages and storage units filled with toys. And yet so few of them are happy. So few of them are experiencing joy. The, the research from recent years on happiness says that less than a third of people in the U.S. claim to be happy. And that number has been steadily declining since the year 2000. We live in this society that says, don't encroach on my freedom to pursue happiness. Don't keep me from chasing that. And it even calls that pursuit a God-given right. Now, when that version of freedom feels threatened, the pursuit of happiness feels threatened, people get pretty angry and they want to fight back. They want to bite and devour. But notice the way the Apostle Paul talks about freedom. The Apostle Paul starts the entire conversation leading up to the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of joy, by talking about freedom. He says, Galatians 6.13, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, like to get. Remember, demanding the flesh demands. He says, rather, serve one another humbly in love. It's giving. It's producing. That's what the Spirit does. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Now, can you see how different the Apostle Paul's version of freedom is from Thomas Jefferson's version of freedom? Can you see the stark contrast there? Is freedom the pursuit of happiness? Or is freedom serving one another humbly in love? It's easy to feel pretty inflamed if the pursuit of happiness is being encroached upon. Hey, that's mine. Hey, don't take that from me. And people want to bite and devour one another. But we remember the difference between the flesh and the spirit. The flesh demands, hey, that's mine. Spirit produces. Freedom isn't about getting, it's about giving. Interestingly, Harvard University did a 75 year long study on happiness, tracking the physical and the emotional health of a diverse group of people. And after 75 years, guess what they found was the single biggest predictor of happiness and fulfillment? Self giving love. So if your version of freedom is all about the pursuit of happiness, joy is going to probably elude you. This world is full of people 
who deeply want to experience joy, but at the same time, their life is oriented around the pursuit of happiness, getting, biggering, bettering, $240 billion worth telling you, your life could be good if you had this. Just think what could be done with that money if that wasn't what we were pursuing. Ending world hunger is estimated from $7 billion to $265 billion, somewhere in there. Joy happens as we serve others. Joy happens as we are generous, as we give, as we expend our lives for the sake of others. And this is the freedom that Jesus lived out of. It's God in you and you in God. Finally, joy and escape. You know, COVID certainly tried to push us all farther towards unhealthy ways of coping with life. Addiction researchers tell us that around half of the people in the United States suffer from at least one addiction. That's a high amount of people. Alcohol, food, work, drugs, gambling, technology, Social media, exercise, shopping, Netflix, sex, porn, to to name a few. In, In many cases, COVID pushed people farther into their addiction. They were isolated from their community of support. They they experienced new versions of, of chronic stress. It was a time when it was, it was hard for them to be them. Uh, every addiction is trying to soothe something that hurts a wound, a dysfunction, some some kind of unresolved pain, some escape reality somehow. Try to numb it. Try to take off that edge somehow. And so uh, in escape, it's like people try to escape one, one mess, one pile of pain, and in so doing, they're creating another mess. They're creating a whole other set of pain as they try to make that escape. So what's joy have to do with this? What does joy have to do with this escape impulse? Well, escape is either an unwillingness or an inability to be you in the present moment. It's, I really don't want to be me right now. I I want to ask you to go back in your memory to the moment, one of the moments when you were in the middle of an unhealthy coping skill recently, uh, in the last couple years, let's say, uh, whether it was an addictive behavior or an unhealthy coping skill, or, you know, some people are like, I don't want to call it this or that, but go back to one of those and find yourself in that moment And then imagine, as you're in that behavior, imagine God's face. Look at God's face. What does God's face look like to you? What do you imagine God saying or doing in that moment? See if you can see God, hear God. A lot of people, that when you ask them, can you imagine God, uh, they can only imagine God being happy with them if their behavior is squared away. Uh, somehow their picture of God is, well, if my behavior is acceptable, then I'm acceptable. But if my hate behavior isn't acceptable, then I'm, I'm not acceptable because my value and my worth is tied up in my doing. It's not in my being. And so they they can't imagine a God who would be rejoicing over who they are if they're in the midst of binging Netflix at 2 a.m. or getting drunk or high or uh, working 60, 70 hours a week. Insert your thing here, whatever it is you're thinking about. Uh, And so 
in that moment, there you are. You're trying to somehow escape being you in that moment, trying to soothe something, resolve something, creating more mess. Underneath it all, what is it that you're trying to escape? Here's the question. It's in that moment, are you experiencing yourself as someone worth rejoicing over? The, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. It's God in you and you in God. And what if your life was permeated with this sense of God constantly rejoicing over who you are? God constantly saying, I am celebrating you because you're you. If God is constantly rejoicing over you, might it help in any way? If you could get in touch with that picture of God rejoicing over you, might it help you stop trying to escape reality and just be able to be present to this moment, this experience, this situation, instead of trying to escape. I have to escape. I got to do this to escape this moment, to just be able to be in this moment. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. You won't find it by chasing it. It's a byproduct. It's a side effect. It grows as you let go of seriousness, as you're able to be playful, as you zoom your perspective out far enough to see God in the absurdity, as you accept that God is rejoicing over who you are, as you celebrate the freedom of serving others humbly in love, as you experience yourself as someone worth rejoicing over. The fruit of a life wrapped up in the joy of God who rejoices because you're you. Love you, friends.